surface become less and less, so the, the surface has to continuously uh, dilate. Um, so this is a pretty uh, um, long way from anatomical descriptions of heart failure, but you see like where we're heading here. Um, <clears throat> then around this time, I mean, we were still only um, able to listen to a person's heart while they were, they were alive using stethoscopes, but this, uh, um, I think he was a resident at the time and he probably didn't get IRB approval for it, but he decided that he's gonna stick, a, I don't know what he was thinking, but he decided to put a catheter inside his heart. Um, and even back then, uh, they knew it was wrong because he had to tie down a nurse so she, because she was trying to prevent him from doing that. He sticks the catheter all the way into his right atrium, gets an gets a x-ray of it, and, uh, um, and then believe I, he was fired after that. And he had a pretty rough time uh, until he came to the U.S. and eventually got a Nobel Prize. But um, <laughs> this was... Uh, um, and, and this is really interesting, like just as a um, you know, tangential note, but key insights and developments in, in medicine were made by, um, by self-experimentation. I mean, there was a lot of like physicians who would inoculate themselves with syphilis. Like there's all sorts of things that these people would do, and then they gained pretty good insights about the disease process. So if there's any fellows out there who want a high uh, impact publication, that's a... Uh, um, so then, you know, Dr. Eugene Braunwald, who a lot of us uh, work with, um, really in his heyday at the NIH, uh, uh, did the experimentations in human beings and found that the Frank Starling laws do uh, also apply to, to people with heart failure. Um, around this time, the famous cardiologist, I think he may be the only one to have a stamp um, um, with his face on it, Paul Dudley White, who, um, you know, was really pushing for a classification of heart failure, and he describes this in a JAMA paper in 1921, uh, where he uh, uh, pushes the New York Association uh, uh, cardiac clinic uh, functional status classification of heart failure that we still use today. Um, so, so this is when we started thinking about heart failure in terms of well, you know, human beings have a need to classify. So. Um, so like how do we classify heart failure? Do we use functional status? Do we use ejection fraction? And then around the same time, um, there were studies that were being, I mean, this was later on, but we could do ventriculograms uh, and then the rise of echocardiograms uh, that allowed us to image the heart. And that's when we started uh, measuring ejection fraction. We found that it has prognostic value and it was really a good simplistic way of describing heart failure and it's really taken out. So even when I'm you know, when I call the emergency room and they're trying to admit someone with heart failure, the first thing they'll tell me is ejection fraction. Um, so this is really uh, one of the ways that uh, it came about. So this has to do with, with uh, how we classify heart failure. So um, then um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, you know, we were still not able to do this in patients who came into the hospital, like invasively uh, measuring uh, uh, hemodynamics was still uh, uh, something that that was required a lot of uh, maybe research uh, um, in the research realm. But then um, Dr. Swan and Gans came up with this idea that let's just stick a uh, balloon at the end of the catheter so it can float down uh, into the right heart and then up into the pulmonary artery. And like this description is really cool because he describes uh, he was walking with his kids uh, on the beach and he was seeing all these boats go by and that's when his idea came by. So uh, this prompted me to uh, spend time outside my cubicle. Uh, but, but essentially what you could do is you could um, insert a catheter into patients when they came in with acute decompensation and, and measure what their pressures are. This is the really um, a groundbreaking paper from the New England Journal where they did um, do um, swan gan catheters into patients with acute myocardial infarction and they came up with the Forrester diamond classifications of MI and these were eventually um, kind of taken up by heart failure as well and a lot of people still use this quite a bit where they describe heart failure in terms of well, what's the congestion level, what's the perfusion level, the, the dry and warm and but warm uh, um, that, that we teach interns about still in the hospital. Um, so, so the next uh, um, you know big insights were the fact that all these bio, all these biological measurements are abnormal in patients with heart failure. Uh, this is Dr. Cohen, who uh, one of the few people who first people to discover that neuro, neurohormonal activation is 
um, is in disarray in heart failure. So maybe there's a molecular component that goes beyond anatomy and physiology. And then finally, this is where we are right now. Heart failure is a syndrome that results from a lot of different uh, dysfunction in multiple biological pathways. Um, so we've kind of come full circle to Galen's theory of, uh, of evil humors. But um, so now our, you know, our definition of heart failure is it's this combination of physical, physical exam findings, anatomy, pathophysiology, some biomarkers in there, and then clinical assessments of what patients are. So since, you know, the Ebers, Paris, like this is uh, essentially the culmination of what we call heart failure. So the obvious like next question is, are all these key insights uh, translating to cures? Uh, for the most part, no. Um, for most of history, uh, heart failure was treated by bloodletting. Um, the ancient Greeks did it. This is a, I think it's a German text on, um, it's an entire big text on where to, to bloodlet from based on the symptoms of the disease. So they got very, very specific about it. Um, and even uh, um, George Washington was bled out. Um, he developed sepsis and I think, uh, so it was used for treating lots of different uh, uh, ailments. Digitalis was one of the big uh, treatments for heart failure uh, for, for many hundreds of years. This is an account on uh, foxglove. It's an extract of the foxglove plant. Um, this is uh, um, William Witheringa, who's one of the British physicians who described it in detail. Um, he was uh, Charles Darwin's uncle, by the way. Um, so he, you know, Digitalis is used probably unsuccessfully for many hundreds of years. They didn't know how to dose it. People, a lot of people got um, ditch toxicity, I'm sure, but um, it, you know, was the only real treatment that they had other than bloodletting. Uh, then the ditch trial came along in um, in '97, and and since then, digitalis has been used only in a, in a few uh, subgroups of patients. Uh, these are Southy tubes. Uh, I've seen Dr. Basher has one. Um, so what they are is. Uh, uh, people with heart failure develop a lot of edema, which is swelling in their legs and, and everywhere else. Um, now we have diuretics for this, but before they did, they would literally stick uh, these, these metal tubes inside the, um, inside the edema to get fluid off. It doesn't seem like a very, uh, um, but I mean, in the absence of anything else, I think that that's all they had to do. Uh, this is from 1932, Paul W.I. describing how to use it. Um, so even in the, at this time, we didn't really have diuretics, but there was some sense of the fact that we can, there's some, you know, some medications can cause a diuretic effect. So um, he was, uh, one of the American medical students was in Germany uh, where he treated a, uh, a young um, boy who came in with, uh, with what they thought was syphilis. So syphilis was um, essentially like the very common diagnosis at the time. And mercury was a very common treatment for a lot of different things. They gave him mercury. He diuresed a lot before he passed out. So there was this sense that perhaps, like, uh, you know, we can use these medications for diuresing people. But they were far too toxic to use it in, in general terms. Um, this is a, a publication from the New England Journal of 1949 where they described the use of, uh, of uh, sulfanilide, um, sulfa-based uh, uh, therapy on diuresis. Now, this is what um, this medication looks like, and this is ferrosamide. So, so you know, getting back um, memories from organic chemistry, but uh, they they had to make uh, that uh, jump to be able to use it in an effective manner in most patients. But that essentially was the precursor to ferrosamide. Um, then this uh, was the first description of thiazides by people by two. Um, authors from pharma. This is in a journal that uh, I don't think it even has an impact factor, but this is a pretty big publication in heart failure. Um, and there were more studies being done in, um, in the hemodynamic effects of these medications. Uh, British Heart Journal um, publishing ferrosamide, and we started uh, being able to use uh, ferrosamide in patients with heart failure. So while, you know, at this point, uh, we have the physicians who are describing patients really well, but we really don't have anything to treat them with, but there's a rise in cardiac surgery. So um, you had um, 
uh, Helen Tossig, uh, Blaylock, William Th Vivian Thomas, Ed, Ed Hopkins do, uh, um, you know, um, uh, tetralogy of follow operations for the first time, and, and we, and surgeons were for the first time uh, seeing that you could actually go in and do cardiac surgery. Then the heart lung machine came into being, and all of a, the, you know, all of a sudden the uh, cardiac surgeons were, were the rock stars of the day because they could actually go in and do something um, to patients with heart failure. This is, a, this is actually a fascinating story. The, the feud between Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey is just, a, um, you know, you could do a full lecture on this, but it's really interesting because they were both uh, in a race, both for transplantation and for um, um, implanting the, the mechanical heart. But this is Denton Cooley who by reports was, uh, uh, had uh, a very high opinion of himself. So do you consider yourself the best surgeon in the world? Yes. Do you think that's being rather immodest? Uh, perhaps, but remember, I'm under oath. So, uh, you know, um, and you can imagine, I mean, you're, you know, you have really no treatments from the medical point of view, and now you're like transplanting actual hearts and coming up with mechanical hearts. That's a, it's a big deal. So around that time, uh, Norm, Norm Shumway was actually, and Rich Lower were the ones who actually developed the um, you know, the basis for being able to do this. Um, and the this, this stories of starting that are really cool as well because they were residents at UCSF. They were working on their off days um, on um, primates and, and really doing this in a meticulous fashion. But Christian Barnhart was uh, a surgeon from South Africa who, who learned a lot of stuff from the U.S. And then he went back to South Africa and he did the first cardiac transplantation on this, uh, I believe it was an ex-boxer um, who, who lasted 18 days or so. Um, but that was, you know, that's a big um, um, change in how we're viewing treating of heart failure. Of heart failure, you could actually replace the heart. Um, subsequently, uh, cardiac transplantation didn't do that well because the issue was with rejection and, and um, infection. And Norm Shumway, for many years, meticulously worked out the, the way to treat. And now, I think at Duke, we're about to do our thousandth transplant, and the uh, success rates are very, very good. Um, around this time, uh, uh, Michael DeBakey's lab was also working on um, on the artificial heart. They did the first uh, implant in 1966. There was a few other things, uh, you know, um, uh, a few other um, um, forays into this uh, into the artificial heart, but it died down for many years until recently. And now we've seen an up uptake in that as well. Uh, lots of different reasons for that. Um, then, you know, the we started making. Uh, um, inroads into the medical treatment of heart failure. This is the first description, as far as I can tell, of, uh, of treatments of, uh, of heart failure with beta blocker. Um, only seven patients came in with acute heart failure, did really well with, uh, with beta blockers in the British Heart Journal. And then you move on to the use of uh, ACE inhibitors. This is Mark Pfeffer working with Gene Braunwald and his wife uh, in the lab and found that captopril can reduce um, uh, what bad things that happened to the left ventricle after myocardial infarction, then the large trials showed that uh, that indeed is the case. And then ACE inhibitors also came into the picture. So that um, now it's kind of understood beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, aldosterone antagonism is the mainstay of treatment for heart failure. So now we have all these therapies. We have mechanical therapies, uh, transplant, uh, medical therapies. Have we solved the problem? But uh, not really. It gets, uh, you know, partly because we're getting good at treating myocardial infarction. Heart failure is becoming more and more of a big problem. Uh, discharges from heart failure are going up. Uh, um, hospitals are getting uh, dinged for, for readmission. So it's, a, it's actually a very, very big problem now. Um, so I wanted to step back and see, well, have we, have we actually done, um, um, you know, a lot of, uh, have we made a lot of inroads? And, and I think that's, that is the case. If you look at, uh, uh, these these uh, gentlemen who had access to good treatments uh, for for their uh, illnesses, um, Roosevelt had uh, um, suffered from um, fairly profound congestive heart failure. That's a tracing of his blood pressure, and would live in the high 200s. Uh, um, he was, uh, um, I think, for for some of his terms, he couldn't even get out of bed. Um, he was so debilitated. Um, his physician told him that uh, the treatment should be you should snuggle with your wife. Um, it, because there was really no treatments for them. And when he suffered his stroke, his blood pressure was in the 300s. So, you know, you had uh, um, someone like him not really have access to too many treatments. Um, 
And Eisenhower also had a really large uh, anterior myocardial infarction, still um, uh, went for the second term. And I think he could barely get out of bed for, for a lot of that time because he suffered from uh, fairly profound heart failure. Uh, but then we move forward to, uh, to Dick Cheney, who's uh, um, had several myocardial infarctions, had a bypass, stents, uh, ICDs, uh, medical therapies, left ventricular cyst device, and finally a transplant. So um, I think that that really signifies how far we've come in the treatment of people who do have access to good medical care. So, so where do we go now after the low-hanging fruit? It seems like we've uh, managed to treat, uh, um, we've managed to come up with treatments that are fairly effective, but, uh, but not as effective as we'd like to be. Um, so being an uh, investigator of, uh, of novel treatments in heart failure is, um, is, is a pretty, uh, you have to have uh, um, you know, emotional fortitude because uh, the chances are that therapies are not going to work. Um, this is, uh, you know, all these therapies had really good um, biological rationale for, for their uh, development, but they've all uh, failed. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with uh, um, the last one, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. Um, we can take Nasertide as an example because that was, um, you know, the SEND trial was done here at Duke with, uh, with Dr. O'Connor. Um, the phase two stuff looked really, really good, and that's why it was, uh, it was approved for use. But then when you do the large trials of, uh, of patients with acute heart failure, or chronic heart failure, it really didn't pan out. I mean, the SEND was 7,000, more than 7,000 patients, really didn't do anything better than placebo. And then uh, Dr. Topol wrote this uh, blistering uh, um, article in the New England Journal, um, really uh, uh, about how uh, um, we did a disservice to patients and stuff. Um, so, so why did these trials fail? I think that, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of different people. I mean, there's very, very smart people here and everywhere else who come up with different theories. One of the things that I've done uh, um, to try to explain this is that perhaps we're using, uh, we need to revisit this question of what heart failure is uh, um, because we're putting in a lot of different patients with different disease states into these trials. I mean, you have a 60-year-old male with heart failure from a big MI. He's got a dilated cardiomyopathy, 82-year-old female. He's got long-standing hypertension, some renal failure, 35-year-old um, African-American with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. I mean, these are very different disease states that we're lumping into one disease. Um, you know, I think that a way to um, look, at, look at this would be comparing this to edemia, for example. And we have iron deficiency anemia, you have B12 deficiency, you have lots of different causes of anemia, and you can't really treat them all in the same way uh, because you'll generally um, lead to uh, null uh, findings. Uh, so the current inclusion criteria for heart failure, if you look at, they generally depend on ejection fraction near heart association class. There's no real good correlation between ejection fraction and um, EF, and we all know about NYHA class being such a um, it, it's always fluctuating, depends on a lot of different confounders, depends on who's uh, classifying the patient, and there's no good correlation with, uh, with objective measures either. Um, so I wanted to end very quickly with, uh, with you know, what, what we've tried to do um, to, uh, to tackle this question. Um, sure, a lot of people, uh, this would be new to a lot of people. This is the, um, this is, uh, the concept of cluster analysis. It's one of the um, things that, that we've come up with as a result of uh, uh, the big data um, revolution. So now if you, go, um, if you go to Google, for example, they'll give you ads that are, um, that are exactly based on what they think that you should be interested in, which, which match up a lot with, uh, uh, with what reality is. If you go to Target, for example, they're actually doing analyses on, on your behavioral patterns, which is why I keep getting uh, coupons uh, uh, for, for diapers. So this is, a, you know, this is a, a whole new world where we have access to a lot of data. And the question is, well, um, can we use that in heart failure to be able to improve phenotyping of disease? So what cluster analysis does, it's an unsupervised learning task of grouping a set of or objects uh, in the way that the objects in the same group are more similar to each other than those in other groups. 
So we decided to do this in the two large trials that we have here at Duke. So chronic heart failure, the HF action study of uh, 2,331 patients who were randomized to exercise versus not. Again, um, you know, the criteria were NYHA and uh, EF. Um, and they were generally in North America, US, and some in France. Uh, and then we used data from the ASCEND heart failure trial, which is more than 7,000 patients hospitalized with acute heart failure. We were randomized to nisiratide versus placebo. This was an international study. And these are just, uh, um, and when we did the clustering algorithm, these are the variables that we used. We tried to use as many variables as possible. Um, and the way that the clustering algorithm works is that you really need to have complete data on these, uh, these variables. So we had to go down to 1,600 patients for, for chronic heart failure and 4,000 patients for acute heart failure. Um, so we got interesting results for chronic heart failure. We got two, uh, four different clusters. The cluster one was uh, uh, generally elderly Caucasian uh, males with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, lots of comorbidities. Cluster two was uh, younger African Americans who had non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, not that many um, uh, comorbidities. Cluster three was uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy patients with a lot of angina. So cluster one, even though they had um, ischemic cardiomyopathy, they really didn't have any angina, but cluster three did. And um, cluster four were patients who were more likely to be female, really didn't have that many comorbidities. And uh, in general, their profile was pretty good other than the fact that they had heart failure. Um, these are objective measures. I mean, you could see how um, different uh, their, their measures are. So you go from a peak VO2 of 13.5 in one cluster to 17.5 in cluster four. Um, their BNP levels are also very, very different uh, as are ST2 and galactin levels. Um, and when you look at the risk of adverse outcomes, uh, what was dramatic, uh, what was very interesting to me was the disconnect between uh, the risk of readmission and mortality, which, which is kind of interesting when you think of uh, um, you know, the focus on readmissions. When we did this in acute heart failure, we got six clusters. And in this case, uh, the acute heart failure um, trial was more international, so we did have access to, uh, to Asian uh, patients as well. Cluster one and two was essentially all Asian. Uh, one was ischemic, one was non-ischemic. Then cluster three uh, recapitulated the African-American phenotype that we had had with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Cluster four uh, was uh, Caucasians with ischemic cardiomyopathy and a lot of comorbidities. Cluster five sounded, uh, seemed a lot um, like this HEF-PEF phenotype that we talk about females with, uh, elderly females with uh, atrial fibrillation, higher ejection fractions. And then cluster three was uh, patients with concomitant renal disease. So these are their, um, their biomarkers. Again, very disparate uh, levels of these biomarkers. And again, the risk of adverse outcomes, you see a big disconnect between risk of readmission uh, and all-cause death as well, as well as the different uh, outcomes. So our conclusions in these papers have uh, been submitted. We'll see what the uh, reviewers think, but uh, essentially this has never been done in heart failure. I went through the literature and I couldn't find any other. Um, it's been done in uh, other disease states that require phenotyping, such as COPD, for example, but I couldn't find this in heart failure. But uh, we found uh, unique phenotypes of acute and chronic heart failure. Um, but the, the message is not to, to identify you know, that this is what a heart failure phenotype is, but just to, to show that there's a huge amount of disease heterogeneity and we need to uh, phenotype heart failure better. Um, so, you know, the question is like, we've moved on uh, from the hemodynamic method of looking at heart failure to more and more biologi biological methods, but we're still functioning within this paradigm of what heart failure is. And I think perhaps we need to revisit that paradigm and then re-examine heart failure within that, other than just looking at, at biological measurements within the same umbrella. I mean, there was hundreds of years when investigators uh, examined uh, heart failure or other disease states in, um, under Gal Galen's uh, uh, paradigm, and, and they were unfortunately linking it to something that may not be correct in the first place. So I wanted to end with uh, two books that I was forced to read in undergrad that uh, now I understand uh, how they were so important. Um, so this is from Plato's Republic, and he describes uh, um, um, these, it's a, it's a long story, but they're people who are, uh, who are tied down to, uh, to a cave, and all they can do, they can't move their heads, but they can look at uh, a reflection 
of uh, what's going on outside the cave based on the shadows that they see. And as they get more and more enlightened, the, the philosophers are able to actually rise up and, be, and uh, go outside and see what's actually going on. But you're restricted to uh, making sense of the world based on these shadows. And I think we've kind of moved more and more further along uh, in being able to see the truth, but we're still far off. And then this is, uh, this is an amazing book. It's from uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, where the concept of paradigm shifts comes from. But, uh, you know, Thomas Kuhn, like, really studied this in detail, like, what causes uh, um, scientific revolution. And he says that the research scientist is not an innovator, but a solver of puzzles. And he concentrates on what uh, he can um, solve or state within the existing scientific uh, tradition. Um, and then unanticipated no novelty or new discovery can only happen when um, when you keep doing certain experiments and they keep going wrong, and then you have to revisit the entire um, concept itself. So perhaps we need to do that in heart failure. Um, so I'd like to thank all my mentors. Uh, Mike, who's put up with me for two years. Uh, Adrian, Dr. O'Connor, uh, who's been amazing. Dr. Peterson, who let me uh, come here and do my research uh, time at DCRI. Uh, Dr. Bashir, who's uh, really... Um, um, you know, gets excited about the history of medicine and shows me all his cool stuff in his uh, his office. And then Dr. Uh, Pensina and, and Phil, who've really helped out with the with the cluster analysis, and they've been pretty excited about this. And uh, of course, I have to uh, thank my family uh, who uh, been uh, you know put up with me. That's my two year old who's uh, finding an article in Jack Heart Failure very exciting. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. That was wonderful. Any questions or comments? This was an awesome lecture. Uh, I have lived this lecture from the time of the, uh, the 1952 Time magazine you saw, which made me decide to be a heart surgeon when I was 16 years old and, and not yet graduated from High school decided didn't need to, went on to college and, and uh, finally went to Hopkins and ended up at Duke. Uh, but you have put all of this very complex information in an exactly appropriate context. Uh, this is totally accurate and, and as perfect as anyone could do it. In fact, I was thinking about doing this myself, but you've done it better than I could have done it. I do hope uh, you'll convert this into a lecture and make it available because uh, this, these slides are fairly, fairly unique. Um, if you have some time, some time we can get together, I can tell you stories about going to the airport <laughs> with great. Dr. DeBakey or yeah. sitting down with, uh, you know, Blaylock and, and so forth. So we could, we could even add a little bit more uh, insight into the people. Uh, but uh, one of the nice things about medicine is that you instantly fall uh, into a colleague relationship when you share things like this with others who have your same interest. And uh, then once you begin to have the opportunity to do that internationally, as I've had, it just, it just grows exponentially. And that's one of the side benefits of medicine. Uh, the detraction from medicine is it takes you away from your family <laughs> because you get too excited about what you're doing in medicine sometimes. But uh, if we remember that, uh, downside, the medicine can't be uh, really improved on as a career. You can do a lot of other things besides medicine, but it really, uh, I think you can see the vibrance that comes through. And these last pictures really show why we do it. Because uh, we have a family, and when we take care of patients, they have a family. And uh, as long as we keep that orientation in medicine, uh, it just becomes a lifelong uh, compulsion, but one that's very worth it. Thank you. Very well said. Mike? So, Tarek, great, uh, great talk, uh, echo Bob's uh, comments. I guess one of the implications of, I mean, I, I implied in your, in your saga was that one reason that we recently are having more and more failures in clinical trials or developing new treatments is that, I guess one is that a lot of the easy things have already been, the things that are going to work in everybody have already basically been developed, and so we need to do better uh, targeting and so 
is, which I think is very sensible. Can you imagine how the sort so this the sort of statistical approach that you're putting together is fairly complicated? And can you imagine a way that you could actually take those concepts and put them into a clinical trial to identify a particular patient population? Um, so, so I think that's the the whatever billion dollar question that all these pharma companies are probably dealing with. Um, I think that, you know, being on, on different trials, uh, for example, I'll give you um, um, a question, an example of a phone call that I had uh, about a patient, whether they qualify for acute heart failure or not, and they met all the criteria for this trial, and then the person calling me about the trial said, well, they're also 99 years old. Um, so I think that um, we have access to a lot of data now that we can use to maybe pinpoint uh, different uh, um, groupings of patients within heart failure. We could use the clinical data, but we also have access to you know, things like biomarkers, metabolomics. And once we're able to, um, to come up with a, I, I think instead of like jumping the gun and going towards the clinical trial, perhaps first we need to identify which the subgroups are and then move from there. Um, because I think that if you, um, whatever medication, however effective it is, like if you use it in, in people who are so different, um, we not, might not be able to get the signal. But at the same time, I mean, um, I'm sitting here with a lot of experts on clinical trials and heart failure, so um, I would love your thoughts as well. Um, I would love it if you started even the hospital doing what Target does when you, when you walk in, using data on patients all the time to be able to find out about how they'll do. Um, I mean, when I'm on call or overnight um, and the patient gets readmitted, you essentially like reinvent the wheel. Like you go through their clinical chart, like you rewrite um, what's going on with them. We don't have any access to what happened to them before um, or how their disease is going to proceed, even though we have the data that allows us to be able to do that. Um, so not a good answer to your question, but um, I think being able to use more data to revisit what it is that heart failure is. Rick, how are we doing with using that information that theoretically is the Duke Cardiovascular Database? You're the expert, so it seems to me we've really stalled. I haven't heard anything creative for the past 10 years at Duke coming from the database. We've reproduced what Dan Mark did. He's the last person I remember that did anything really creative. That was creative? <laughs> <laughs> the development of, of uh, yeah, that index was extremely creative. And he documented it. It's in the guideline, the first guideline that we did. Um, you, don't, you don't have to engage with O'Connor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris is smart, too. Right? <laughs> Quite a few others. Uh, Tarek, great, great uh, tour de force there. One of the things, uh, I think you hit on it, like Mike said, is how do we better classify heart failure patients so we can develop therapies that improve outcomes. One thing you might do, and I can't remember, I should because I saw these papers come through, um, if we analyze more carefully the mode of death by cluster, could we then begin to see a separation of um, basically different strategies to go after, i.e. sudden death, pump failure death, or ischemic mediated uh, death, uh, particularly because you described some uh, clusters that were, you know, had a lot of angina and ischemic etiology and others that were different, so. so that's a really good question, Dr. Connor. I'm actually meeting with Dr. Pensina in two hours to discuss how um, we're going to do some of the analysis. But right now, the way we've done the cluster analysis, and we've really not had um, any papers, classic papers to go on. We're just kind of creating it as we go. Uh, we've used the baseline characteristics to create the clusters, but they're, what Google does, from what Phil tells me, is that they use outcome data on what people are clicking on to be able to come up with, uh, with their clusters. So perhaps we should be uh, connecting the clusters to outcomes uh, to come up with more biologically important clusters, plus when we are measuring all these uh, biological specimens uh, in these patients as well, we put those, uh, that information into the clusters as well. Um, I think that would be a really interesting study to do and see what happens. We, we haven't done that yet. Chris, you know we have 2,136 patients that we have survival on, and we have everything else you want to know about the physiology and, and you know, in the STITCH database. So the data is there. So, Chris, I hope you and others in the room uh, will take time to put it together. Look at it.
What do you think? I think that's the next step. We, we just published in that Say no to your administrative meetings and come on and get back and <laughs> do some uh, some The motive death from Stitch was just published in Jack Hartfield and I think uh, you could go backwards and do your cluster analysis. It would be very interesting. I have seen a, a, a adjudication form from CDC uh, definition of the cardiologist uh, heart failure. Would you remember which study was highlighted? Uh, is this study still ongoing? Did we change the definitions? Uh, is it the current form? Or I would like to ask as a CDC member. I'm just interested. <laughs> Oh, I, I think we could probably talk about that offline um, yes. because it's still an ongoing study and uh, we have to be careful about how much um, we talk about it. But we could talk about that offline as to what we did. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Tara. Thanks. One last thing. Plug for the survey. Can you go to the last slide? Sure. Um, we sent out a survey a couple weeks ago for the DCRI Research Conference and we'd love feedback on what's working well, what people's preferences might be, suggestions for speakers. Um, it'll take you less than a, a minute or two. And uh, we really, really like everybody else's uh, uh, contribution to how we're doing this and how you'd like to see it happen. So thank you. Oh. Thanks, man. Thank you. That's great. Hope it went OK. It was great.